Okay, so today we're going to be looking more closely at hitting and breaking, uh, both from the perspective of the article that you read, as well as what FrameNet has already defined. And our topics are, uh, as usual, first some practical matters, uh, then hitting and breaking uh, in greater detail. And we're going to do an exercise looking at uh, Portuguese data during the class. I also want to remind you uh, about your reading for tomorrow, the article on reframing FrameNet data. As I said, we'll do an in-class exercise uh, looking at Portuguese data. And the homework assignment requires you to download two documents from the course website. You will have some more information about that at the end of the class. You recall that last week when I introduced uh, frame semantics, we briefly looked at uh, the grammar of hitting and breaking, just to remind you that the key ideas brought out in that article were about valence and the difference between role and entity. We looked at um, some examples with the verb hit, as seen on this slide. I'm not going to read them because I don't want to take too much time, as well as break. And it's important to remember that um, valence of break differs from the valence of the verb hit. Cause impact is one of the frames that FrameNet has defined for one of the senses of hit. Here are some examples of that lexical unit in that frame. Mika hit the rock with his open hand. Nadja hit the ruler against the desk. I've listed a few more of the other uh, lexical units that uh, live in the cause impact frame. In addition to hit, we have jab, plow, collide, run. <clears throat> On this slide, you see annotations of the original examples that I gave you at the beginning. Uh, Mika is the agent. The rock is the impactee. With his open hand is the impactor. Nadia is the agent. The ruler is the impactor. And against the desk is the impactee. Notice the difference, notice the alternation in uh, the, first, com the first sentence compared with the second sentence where in the first sentence, we have the impact D as the direct object, and in the second sentence, we have the impact or as the direct object. We, look at, we can look at the valence description of the sentences that I've given you so far. Uh, in the first case, we have uh, the impactor in subject position, and in the, uh, sorry, in both cases we have the agent in subject position, and in one case we have the impactor as the object with the impactee as the dependent in a prepositional phrase beginning with the preposition with. In the second case, we have the uh, object as the impact T. 
with the impactor as the dependent in a prepositional phrase that begins with the preposition against. Here's a frame definition for cause impact. An agent causes an impactor to make sudden forcible contact with an impactee or manipulates two or more impactors so that they make mutual, for, mutual forcible contact. <clears throat> Notice that I've included in uh, square brackets here the rest of the full definition of the cause impact frame. So cause alternates with agent. This is more, a bit more complicated than what I'm going to um, go into today, but I am going to pass it along for Michael to talk about <laughs> officially. In English, we say, I pass the buck to Michael. And fortunately, he accepted the buck. <laughs> Let's look at the core frame elements of the cause impact frame. We have an agent who causes an impactor to make sudden forcible contact with an impactee. Or the agent manipulates two or more impactors so that they make mutual forcible impact. Our impactor is the entity that hits the impactee because of the agent's efforts. And we have the impactee, which is the entity that the impactor hits. Let's look at some of the non-core frame elements in the frame. Remember that core frame elements uniquely define the frame, and non-core frame elements, whether they are peripheral or extra thematic, are not necessarily unique to the frame. They're not unique to the frame. We can have a manner frame element, which identifies the manner in which the agent causes the impactor to make sudden forcible contact with an impactee. We can have a purpose, the purpose for which the agent does all of that, the time, the time at which all of that happens. In this frame, we have subregion as a non-core frame element. And the subregion is the part of the larger whole that the agent hits. Let's look at some examples with annotations of non-core frame elements. So as we know, peripheral frame elements are used for events in general and are not unique to a specific frame. Here's our example. Mika hit the rock with his open hand quietly, where quietly instantiates the manner frame element, a peripheral frame element in our frame. We also have extra thematic frame elements, which evoke another frame. So strictly speaking, they are coming to this frame from a different frame. Michael will explain in greater detail uh, the theoretical and practical considerations that uh, we thought about in order to define extra thematic frame elements in the way that we have defined them. Let's look at an example. Mika hit the rock on the left side with his hand, where the prepositional phrase on the left, 
on the left side instantiates the extra thematic frame element subregion. Now let's look at an example in the FrameNet desktop. I've highlighted the example, I've copied the example uh, that's annotated here. Of course, when you get the PDF, you can look at it uh, and see it uh, better than you can see it on the slide. But the highlighted example, the example that's annotated here is the question, are you admitting I've hit the nail on the head? Of course, are you admitting I've hit the nail on the head could in principle be used literally. It's hard to imagine, however, that anybody would actually ever say that sentence and mean it literally, literally, right? Someone's watching me hit the nail on the head and they say, you hit the nail on the head, to which I respond, are you admitting that I hit the nail on the head? In, a situa in, an, in an actual situation uh, where you would use that sentence, uh, it couldn't be used literally, okay? And um, we're looking at this so that I could bring up the uh, topic of metaphor in FrameNet and briefly uh, indicate how FrameNet handles metaphor. Of course, since Michael is here, later in the week, he'll talk about that in greater detail. <laughs> he, came, he, came, he came as my sidekick. <laughs> and I could provide greater entertainment in these lectures now that he's here. Okay, so you might think that um, uh, there's a framal distinction here, but in fact, it's not. So whereas, uh, right now what we're looking at is the frame element layer. So you see the list of the frame elements in the bottom pane of the FrameNet desktop. Um, and I might just ask you to note that the impactor frame element is uh, indefinitely null instantiated. That's not what we see here. They went up forward twice. Oh, so you need to go back. Are we on the right one now? Okay. So, so notice that you see the uh, frame element layer here. And you have the list of frame elements available for annotation in this frame. And two, three, the fourth one down on the left is uh, INI. So you also see there in the sentence that INI is labeled at the end of the sentence, and that's the impact or. Okay? So that's the frame element label. A layer. Now notice what FrameNet does for a special annotation of uh, sentences. That is, we know it's a special case of the frame that we're considering. It's a, it, the example is uh, something different from what we uh, want to annotate in this frame. And to record that information in the database, we have a layer that we call the sentence layer. That's the view that you see now. And the arrow on the right points to the label metaphor. And the arrow pointing left points to the label idiom. So FrameNet records that uh, hit the nail on the head is a metaphorical use of hit in this frame. It also happens to be an idiom. So we've indicated both of those. <clears throat> the 
very briefly, this is how FrameNet handles metaphor. We annotate, <clears throat> we annotate uh, an example sentence in the same frame if the metaphorical use of the LU is productive semantic is a productive semantically based metaphor and it applies to a well-defined subset of lexical units in that frame. Here are some examples. In the healing frame, using the lexical unit cure, as in Dr. Spock cured the patient, we have a literal use of the lexical unit cure. I can say Dr. Spock cured the patient or Dr. Spock cured the disease. Dr. Spock is the healer. The patient is the patient in the first sentence. In the second sentence, Dr. Spock is the healer, and the disease is the affliction. Those are examples of the literal use of the lexical unit cure. The next two examples illustrate metaphorical use of the lexical unit cure. In the first case, we have truth and reconciliation may cure the society. Where truth and reconciliation instantiate the, the frame element healer. And the society instantiates the frame element patient. This is a metaphorical use of the lexical unit cure. Truth and reconciliation is not a human being in the way that healer, or the, I should say the way that Dr. Spock is a human being. The society is not a patient as, say, if I said Dr. Spock cured Michael, right? In the second example of the metaphorical use of the set of the lexical unit cure, truth and reconciliation again is not a healer in the same way that Dr. Spock is. And the ills of society is not an affliction in the same way that, say, measles are an affliction. Okay, so that's an example of uh, a case where we annotate the metaphorical use of the lexical unit in the same frame because it's a productive, semantically based metaphor. In the next slide, <clears throat> I illustrate when, meta, when FrameNet, are we on the right slide? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. In this slide, you see what FrameNet does for a metaphor in a separate frame, or what criteria FrameNet is to decide when we annotate a metaphorical use of a lexical unit in its own frame, that is, in a different frame from the literal sense. The criterion is lexical idiosyncrasy. And here's an example. In English, the lexical unit put down, as in to put someone down in the sense of demeaning or belittling them, we annotate that use of put down in its own frame, a separate frame from the literal sense. The literal sense 
is illustrated in the first sentence, they lowered the firemen into the sewer. Imagine a scene where firemen come, there's some fire underground, so the, the other firemen lowered one of them into the sewer. Literally, they take him, they help him get down there, they lower him down. The metaphorical use of put down is illustrated in the second sentence. The critic put down the author rather sharply. I cannot say the critic lowered the author rather sharply. Unless you have in mind that I put the author in the sewer. Question? But can I... But can I say uh, they put the they put down the firemen they put the firemen down into the sewer? Yes, and that has to do with how um, uh, verb particle constructions work. Uh, but it's not it's not a framal distinction, right? Okay. Does everybody get the difference between? When we annotate a metaphorical use in the same frame as its literal use, and when we annotate a metaphorical use in a separate frame from the literal use. Questions? OK, let's go on. FrameNet also has another frame with the lexical unit hit. That frame is the impact frame. Here are some examples. The shuttle hit the station. The table was hit by a piece of the roof that fell down in the storm. Let's look at some other lexical units in the impact frame. Brush, bump, impact, the noun, impact, the verb. Collide, collision, strike, touch. If you look at the FrameNet frame on the FrameNet website, if you look at the impact frame on the FrameNet website, you'll notice another category of verbs in impact that I haven't listed here. And I haven't listed them deliberately. Because again, like many of the frames that we're talking about, it's a little more complicated than what I'm showing you now, because I want to make a certain point now, and I don't want to be distracted by the other factors that come into play for that frame. But I don't want you to think that this is the entire story. Here are... Uh, some of the core frame elements in the impact frame. We have an impactor. The impactor identifies the entity that hits the impactee. And we have an impactee. The impactee is the frame element that identifies the entity that the impactor hits. Let's look at some example annotations. <clears throat> the train hit the station. The train instantiates the impactor. The station instantiates the impactee. And in our second sentence, <clears throat> The table was hit by a piece of the roof that fell down in the storm. <clears throat> the table instantiates the impact T. By a piece of the roof that fell down in the storm instantiates the impactor. Let's look at another LU in this frame. Consider the sentence, 
the players collided on the field. <clears throat> the verb collide requires that we include another frame element to completely define this frame. We call that frame element impactors. That frame element identifies the entities involved in an impact considered symmetrically, that is, with no special focus on any of the individual entities. You may recall that we had a similar concept in the attaching frame. We had item one, item two, and we had items. <clears throat> where item is illustrated in a sentence such as, they tied my hands together, right? They, no, my hands are the items, right? Same idea. The players instantiate the impactor's frame element, and on the field instantiates place as a frame element, which is, in this case, a peripheral frame element. <clears throat> it just so happens that hit as a verb in this frame is possible, you could find sentences, but without a lot of context, they sound very unnatural. So I introduced the verb collide. Let's look at our frame definition for the frame Im impact. While in motion, an impactor makes sudden forcible contact with the impactee, or two impactors both move, mutually making forcible impact. In this frame, we actually have a cause frame element that alternates with agent. That's a little more complicated than what I'm presenting today. Fortunately, Michael is here, and I pass the buck to him. Here's the valence description for, <clears throat> or at least one key set of valence descriptions for um, the impact frame. We can have the impactor as a noun phrase external, with the impactee as the object dependent. Or we can have the impact T as the noun phrase external, with the impactor <clears throat> in a prepositional phrase beginning with the preposition against as the dependent. Alternatively, we can have the impactors as the external noun phrase, right? The players collided. <clears throat> Here you see a table that summarizes all the instances of hit as a verb in FrameNet. There are many more hits than the, <laughs> there are many more hits in FrameNet than what I've talked about here. Some of them are, um, for some of them we have full annotation. We have a lexical entry. Those are listed in the top section, the top one, two, three, the top four. So in the middle, in the middle column, called LU status, you see finished initial, right? 
Those are ones for which we have a lexical entry report and an annotation report. The work is, the data is there for you to look at. For many other instances of the uh, lexical unit hit, we've only created the lexical unit. Um, we have yet to do any annotation, and only when we have completed some annotation will there be a lexical entry report to consider. Um, yeah, so slate correction. Uh, many of these have lexical entry reports because uh, they were annotated using full text annotation, which uh -huh. I will be showing you in a few days. Um, okay. So, so but, they, but the but the annotation is in, is not adequate. Right. Okay. So you remember last week we talked about a, a, a full text annotation. Um, where you annotate every single frame evoking element in a text. That's what Michael's referring to. The lexical entry, the reason this is uh, only list, the reason the LU status only says created is because this table derives from the lexicographic annotation. That is, the LU status derives from lexicographic annotation. And that, the software reads that and says, ah, we've created it uh, as opposed to we've finished some full-blown lexical, lexicographic annotation. Notice that impact and cause impact are the two frames that Fillmore's paper, The Grammar of Hitting and Breaking, covers. The remaining senses that are listed here have various relations to the two senses we've looked at today. And later in the week, we'll talk more about frame-to-frame uh, -frame relations. And I'm not passing the buck to Michael on that one. OK, let's look at two canonical examples for uh, the two hitting frames that we've discussed so far. We have Mika hit the rock with his open hand in the cause impact frame. And the train hit the station in the impact frame. What criteria do we use to distinguish between the two frames? We look at frame elements. Which frame elements are instantiated in each frame? In cause impact, we have an agent and a cause. And in impact, we have impactors, for example, as typically filling the uh, subject position, typically having the grammatical function uh, external in uh, our sentences. There are different lexical units as frame members in each of the different frames. So for example, in the impact frame, but not in the cause impact frame, we have collide, the noun collision, the noun impact. If you recall, we did not list the verb collide in the cause impact frame. That tells us something. And then, of course, we have different valence descriptions. By virtue of having different frame elements, we're going to have different valence descriptions. That one is pretty straightforward, because uh, frame elements in a frame determine what the valence descriptions are going to be, right? 
So you see, step by step, what are the frame elements? What are the different lexical units? How, what are the different combinatorial possibilities for that lexical unit in one frame compared with another lexical unit in the other frame? OK, now we're going to have our in-class exercise. And Chago has two documents for each of you to look at. As soon as each of you gets each of the two documents, I'm going to give you some instructions about what to do with those documents and give you some time to do what I've instructed you to do. You're going to look at the sentences. You're going to notice which sentence is highlighted, capital letters, bold. I think you have some 50 examples there. Um, you're going to uh, begin to think about how you would characterize the situation in which those sentences would be used. You're going to find constituents in the sentence that might instantiate frame elements of that sentence. <laughs> um, it is written, but OK. It is written, but it's for the other verb I'm going to give them, but it's OK. I'll use that one. So this is advanced, right? Yeah. OK, look, so this is what you need to do. This is going to be your homework assignment, but in class, we're going to do a dry run, a practice for the verb bati. Whatever. <laughs> OK? So why don't you take 10 minutes to start doing this? I don't expect you to come up with all the results right away, but I want to, you to begin to get an understanding of how to do corpus work, OK? And before we break, I have a few more slides that will show you what doing corpus work uh, with the help of a computer that allows you to extract examples, uh, view them in different ways, sort the different, uh, sort in different ways. So obviously, if you do it all manually, it's a lot more difficult. When you have a computer that helps you do it, you could see things more quickly than if you're just doing it by hand, right? And I know that in FrameNet Brazil, uh, FrameNet Brazil, yeah. FrameNet Brazil is going to learn, the people working on FrameNet Brazil are going to learn how to do that automatically. So, okay, go.